Well, uh, I'm indeed thankful for this invitation. And because of that, I'm here. So I'm extremely thankful to the organizer, and particularly Sain Mustafa, who invited me on this particular occasion and giving me this opportunity to reflect my opinion on the whole questions of the comparison between Gulen and Gandhi and their implications for the peace building process, actually, which is indeed a very difficult task, actually. Now, the underlying idea of this comparison is not a question of the privileging and deprivileging upon each other, but essentially, if it come across, it will be the part of the analysis, in fact. Now, let me make two observations here. The, my first observation would be is that, that any moral and ethical discourse and any kind of, like, for example, the Gandhian and Gulen discourse would be extremely difficult to bond them within the modern social science because this model social science is extremely pregnant with the power discourse. And if there is a one thing which is extremely common to this discourse, that they are very far away from the power dimension, actually. No matter how we do analyze this, but that's number one limitation that actually come out of any approach. And precisely because of this reason is that, that it's extremely very difficult to actually to classify or even, for example, categorize these kind of discourses where to put it actually, in fact, because it doesn't fit in the modern understanding of religion and it doesn't fit into, into the very exclusive theological discourse of the religion. And therefore, because that the modernity actually reduce religion or probably expel religion by providing any kind of the social good. And here is a social movement which is derived from the religion and producing the social good. So it's extremely difficult, these two observations, in fact. The third is that, that the both Gulen and Gandhi takes remarkable pride and very heavy pride in their own religious traditions. And the Gandhi assert, that I am Sanatan Hindu, and I take my pride in my religious traditions. Similarly for Fateullah Gulen, that he comes from the orthodox Sunni Muslim traditions. And in anybody probably would have any understanding of the Islamic genealogy of Fateullah Gulen, then probably he would get to know that probably it begins with, like for example, Imam Rabbani, Badhuzama Shaid Nursi, or for example, Imam Ghazali. That's the line actually he comes out actually. So that orthodoxy is very much remarkable there, in fact. Nonetheless, what is remarkable is that, that even though both, I mean, I mean, for example, like for example, the Gandhi is not a product of any religious seminary. He's a product of modern secular educations. Went to the Oxford, I mean, went to, to become the law, joined the inn, and it is actually in the United, United Kingdom, he became vegetarian, actually. And he became vegetarian, not because of any conviction, but precisely one truth and the commitment that he made to his mother, that I won't touch the non-veg. This exactly is this. It's as simple as that. On the other hand, you will find that the Gulen is not a very product of the secular education systems, and is coming from the kind of the religious seminary. But in terms of the constructions of the worldview, the peace and the non-violence, and living together, they come to remarkable conclusion as this. And the reason fundamentally, I believe, is that, that whereas in the modern social science, that the entire philosophy and power, it actually emerged from this particular belief that the mankind and the human kinds are basically aggressive and basically selfish. Therefore, there's a remarkable impasse on the whole question of the mechanisms, on the whole question of instrumentality, on the whole question of discourse, the how to manage the conflict actually. Whereas in the Gandhian and the Gulen discourse, the fundamental belief is that, that human beings are principally cooperative. Human beings are principally peaceful. Therefore, the large world remain peaceful. The large world remains the believing world, and therefore it is the teeny Islamism, or for example, political Islam, or the teeny sanction of fundamentalism that you find in all parts of the religious and find the major part of the globe, in fact. Having said this, what I have done in this paper is very simple, is that, that I have tried to compare the Gandhi and Gulen, or for example, for taking, for example, some of the aspects which they could relate, and this would be in totality, like religion, modernity, notion, of other means and end dichotomy, interfaith and intercultural dialogue, education and democracy. These are the aspects I have tried to see the way they actually fit into, which in totality, I believe, not the one aspect, not only my religion, in fact, which in totality, produce a discourse of positive action, right conduct, love and tolerance, leading to the twin intergoal of negation of notion of other and the development of durable peace. So I think is that, the whole question that how are you going to establish the durable peace, it is internally connected with the eliminations of the notion of others. And when Fatehullah Gulen and Mahatma Gandhi actually speak the other, it is not necessarily the religious other, though their discourse essentially explains in terms of the religious idiom. It will be the Muslims, Hindu, 
or for example the Christian or for example the good Muslim, good Hindu, good Jews, good, good human being. That's the completely discourse you will find. But then this others is also. I mean it could be the peasantry. It could be the industrialist. It could be the man. It could be the women. Therefore it is the philosophy that actually ground itself in the eliminations of any kind of the other. And unless and until you, for example, this other could also operate at the level of national. This other could also be operated at the level of any other categories. So unless and until you eliminate the whole notion of other, a durable peace will not be possible, in fact. Having said this, let me, uh, this two, uh, uh, two, a uh, very small remark is that, that since the entire conference is on the whole question of the peace building process, it assumes to me, since I am here in the conference, that there is overall consensus that what peace building means, and this needs not to be debated actually. Now I believe is that there is a fundamental disjunctions, the way the modernity would like to approach the peace building, and the way the Gandhian and Gulen approach would like the peace building in fact. As I said in the, my remark, in fact, that the entire modern approach on the peace building is state action, international organizations, various kind of domestic NGOs. They are much more focused on the questions of mechanisms. They are much more focused on the questions of the creations of opportunity. They are much more focused on the questions of dealing with the questions of marginalization and the, marginal, and the questions of the, or the questions of, for example, the deprivations actually. So they are dealing with the whole questions of the condition that actually produce violence in fact, you know. But whereas, so this actually deals with the material context. So, but this does not deal with the human power to continue to live in peace despite and trying to deal with the whole questions of the deprivation and marginalizations. The question is not here that you have to accept deprivation and marginalizations. The question is here how to deal with the deprivation and marginalization and believe in your human power and then effectively launch a very peaceful struggle actually. Therefore, what appears to me in the Gulen and the Gandhian discourse is that there is this remarkable focus on the whole questions of what I would like to prefer to call elimination of the internal cognitive condition that lead to the development of the conflict and violence. It is the eliminations of the internal conflict, that the whole question, how do you perceive others actually? It actually, so it is not merely the questions, I would like to emphasize this. It's not merely the questions of the deprivation, or for example, marginalization, for poverty, or for example, illiteracy. I mean, I mean, for me, because the kind of India in which I am living, is in an India where I find that the more formally educated today are rabbit communal. The boys and the girls who are the product of the most modern educational systems are also at the, at the, at the, at the, the faster movement to kill, to kill or, or to participate in the violence. But it is the village. It is those whom you call illiterate in their own language because they do not have certificates that have survived the Indian democracy till date, in fact. That the entire urban India is full of the communal violence and it is those formerly upwardly middle class consumerist who are participating and as a part of the global knowledge productions. It is they who are very much involved in the, any kind of the participation of the violence. But certainly not those whom we consider as illiterate. Those who are the villagers, those who are the part of the peasantries. I mean, there's a not much incident of those kind of communal violence. That is why I do believe it's not a merely the questions of the material deprivations. It's not a merely the questions of the poverty. It's not a merely the question of the exclusion. But it is the whole question of the subjective reading of this dimension that is fully very important. That how do you read that actually and how do you engage with that in fact. It is in this sense that as far as the Gandhian and the Gulen discourse or, or for example this peace building discourse, it has to deal with the whole questions of the eliminations of the internal cognitive conditions that leads to the development of the conflict and the violence. Having said this, that is why remarkably what you find is that, that in both this discourse, Peace building process is not something linked with the questions of the prevention of violence. It's not a question of prevention of violence. Rather, it's an idea build up that you continue to do your positive actions, positive philosophy continuously, ceaselessly, you know. It is only in this process that you will overcome or eliminate the conditions. It is not that because in the modern discourse, the conflict and violence is inevitable. That's an assumption. Since that is inevitable, the only way you can work is to create the institutional mechanism to prevent that. But this institutional mechanism is also run by the human agencies. 
We know that what happened, for example, in the case of Turkey, where, where everything is at the moment is fine, constitution is there, separation of power is there, but there's one man, the human agency is there. They can do anything heavy without any rules and regulations, in fact. So therefore, there is a remarkable impasse on your own moral power, on your own more ethical power, while continuously believing into the positive actions. That's the only way to create the peace building process. Having said this, let me first take the whole issue of the, how they approach religion, both Mahatma Gandhi and Fatehullah Gulen, in fact. The first is that's remarkable is that both Gandhi and Gulen expose ethical and moral understanding of religion and is stress on common universal heritage, roots, principle, values, objectives of all religion and religious traditions. And what are these? Honesty, truth, peace, nonviolence, respect, love, friendship, loyalty, sacrifice, service, brotherhood, harmony, tolerance, compassion, forgiveness, humility, servitude, etc. These are the qualities. And the Mahatma called this revival of Hinduism. And Gulen call it revival of faith or revival of Islam. They are not talking about the revival of Islam or revival of Hinduism in terms of some of the past and the old practices. But some of these universal principles, the universal value systems, you know, I know that I am aware of, for example, the whole question of the relativist approach. That there could be, for example, the relative conception of good. What is good for you from point of view is fine, but that could be not good from my point of view. No? But the point is that Rape is universally condemnable. You cannot justify the rape is condemnable from the women's point of view, but from the men's point of view, it's right. You can't take that position. Lying is universally condemnable. Stealing is universally condemnable, no matter what the power politics you play, actually. You have to be, believe into this. Fundamentally, you have to believe into this. And these are the core values that belong to any religious tradition, the cultural traditions with the Gulen and the Gandhi both simultaneously saying, this is what I mean by revival of faith. Nothing else. These are not saying the revival of namaz, not seeing revival of zakat, not seeing revival of other things, but revival of these fundamental of human values which are extremely important in fact. I do not want to go and, and give all the, for example, the statements uh, which are there because I'm not going to quote many of the statements and this and that. But yes, the second aspect about the religion is that, no time? Oh my God, so, no, I don't have time, I'm sorry then. No, no, it's a, it's a I don't, the, the other aspect is that, for example, that uh, both emphasize rational understanding of religion, but concede supremacy of faith over reason, limitation of human mind in comprehending God's sacred, emphasize essential of religion, and avoid unnecessary ritualism connected with the religious practices. And that's important. Why it is important is that, that Gandhi never considered it is essentially a part of Hinduism to visit temple. Gandhi never visited temple. You do not find the picture of Gandhi going to the temple. There's nowhere. This is not something the essential of Hinduism. And the second reason why he did not visit Hinduism is that, that unless and until the temple actually allows for the untouchables of the scheduled caste in India, he would not visit the temple in fact. Because temple visit is not the part of the original Vedic culture the Gandhi used to believe. Similarly, for Fatehullah Gulen, I mean, for example, beard, or for example, the bodily dresses, or the representation, it is not something, for example, which, are, which, are, which, 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 is, which is. So therefore, what emerged in this discourse is that, that religion is not a matter of identity discourse. It is not a question of identity. It's the question of discourse. And as a discourse, you can go beyond that, actually. That's the position they actually take, in fact. The other is that, the third aspect is that, is remarkable convergence in their mindset about the imagination of God. Now, these days, many of the Muslims actually take Allah a very specific way. We can't use God, we use Allah, as if that, you know, that Allah has some specific, you know. I mean, so, so there, there is this a very, so to, 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 to due respect, to, to, to all the sentiments actually. What actually emerges that for Gandhi and Gulen is that, that love, compassion, mercifulness, this is how the God has been imagined. And for Gandhi, Gandhi used one particular word, truth is God. Earlier he used to believe God is truth. Later he abandoned. And I try to reason out why he abandoned that. What is the difference between the truth is God and the God is truth? 
God is truth is a matter of, for example, a statement of fact. But the truth of truth is God essentially means that you are living with a God consciousness in every moment of your life. You are truthful in your actions. You are truthful in your daughter actually. And the God actually revealed when you are most truthful. So that is why the only description that Gandhi found suits God is truth, nothing else. If you also read Fatehullah Golen, though maybe he doesn't imagine the God in that way, but what's remarkable is that there is a heavy emphasis on the Sufi conception of living under the God consciousness or living with the God consciousness, which is forgiveness, which is compassion, which is peace, which is friendships, that you find a remarkable. Uh, despite this, uh, this convergence, I would say there are three fundamental, and then I will end actually, just one minute, because I am not touching others, that there are three broad fundamental differences between the two. The first is, Gandhi never considered, for example, for Gandhi, for example, what is considered as a revealed, for Gandhi, it was only divinely inspired. It never considered Islam, Christianity, and Judaism or in Hinduism whatsoever. It's a revealed text or the revealed religion. But it is divinely inspired. And since it is divinely inspired, this is subject to the multiple interpretations and subject to three kind of the test. Peace, nonviolence, and truth. Any religious text or any text that comes to these three levels is acceptable to Gandhi, in fact. So first, the major distinctions that actually emerge. And because of this distinction, what you find is that, the Gandhi says is that, that despite believing in God, one can remain Hindu, actually. Despite believing in God, one can remain Hindu. I think this is a problematic proposition for any Muslims or any Muslim scholars, even for that matter, Fatehullah Gulen, to accept that a Muslim can remain a Muslim without believing in God. But that space exists in Gandhi, actually. So an atheist can also remain and Hindu. Second is that, to my understanding is that, that when I try to understand in that in Fatehullah Gulen discourse, Islam to some extent emerges as a project, as a, some kind of the social and political kind of, not, not in Islamism form, I'm saying, but it is the project dealing with the whole question of the, what he called golden generations, uh, which is heavily modeled of the Prophet Muhammad and the first generations. Now this golden generation will assume leaderships in each and every field. It will guide the entire universal humanity. So through part there's an education, there are moral educations. So there is a project. But in the Gandhian discourse, Hinduism does not emerge as a project. Nowhere. Actually, there's no, there's no questions of any kind. He, uh, Gandhi does not advocate that the guidance is something important. We do not know when the guidance can also become the vanguard. And that could be very dangerous, in fact. Because this is how the vanguard actually emerged, in fact. The last is that the whole question where, where the last, in, in this, the, the last, uh, 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 it was discussed actually, the whole question of the notion of self-defense. I am really yet to find for the Gandhi actually, his, his is that, that killing cannot be justified in any manners. And he says that why the cow is a sacred element in the Hindu religious traditions. I would go and persuade my Muslim brother not to eat cow. But even if they continue, I'm not going to kill them, but I would prefer myself Dying to kill the cow, and oh, sorry, I am prefer to die myself to save the life of a cow, as well as saving of life of a Muslim for those fanatic Hindus. That's so, so, so his entire idea, essentially sacrificing myself, and nowhere he justify whether it's a because what has happened is that that you can you can kill, you can justify violence in the name of self defense, even in the Islamic traditions. You know, like for example, if one unjustly, if, if one killing, if killing one person in an unjust manner, it will be killing of the entire humanity. But it is not saying is that if you are killing a person uh, uh, without any unjustly or justly, killing a person will amount to killing a humanity, will be different. But when you say killing a person unjustly, that essentially means that you have a conception of what is just killing and what is unjust killing. And I think is that there's a profound difference between uh, even the Fatehullah Gulen I find is that because I read to, to, to my limited understanding has not without all this problem actually. So uh, the self-defense, the violence becomes obvious in the Islamic or many religious traditions. But the Gandhi has taken uh, remarkably very other positions. In Mahabharat, the Gandhi is pretty clear that nobody kills and nobody was killed. killed. <laughs> That's the positions he actually take. Um, uh, sorry, the time is up, but there are much to say. Thank you very much.